Welcome to Kaiser Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. John, welcome back to Kaiser Watch. Jim, pleasure to be back on the show. John, what will be the topic of your presentation at the upcoming Metals Investor Forum in Vancouver, Canada? The audience is going to want to know how long this market route is going to continue and what the impact will be on the economy uh, locally and globally. And hopefully I can resist the temptation to attempt to answer that because I really do not know how low this general market downturn will go and what the ultimate impact of higher interest rates will be on the economy. And especially given the backdrop that we have, which is the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, the threat of uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, bombs uh, by, by Putin as he digs himself ever deeper into his corner, and uh, Xi Jinping's alliance that he's forged with Russia, which really puts him at odds with uh, the United States and, and the rest of the Western democracy. And, and of course, uh, his zero po- COVID policy, it, it's absolutely insane. He's made it this emotional uh, testament as to the greatness of a central command autocracy like China, and he, it's critical to his um, re-election for third term in November, and he's going to just persist with these lockdowns, which are going to uh, uh, create these uh, supply chain disruptions, make it worse, keep uh, prices for goods uh, from from going down, and uh, you know Putin's uh, distraction is going to be let's drop a nuclear bomb and, and see what the the rest of the world has to say about that, and and Xi Jinping's distraction is. Okay, everybody's mad at me. Let's annex Taiwan and get everybody whipped up into a nationalist fervor and let's see what America does about that. Uh, because both these groups have backed themselves into bad corners and, and predicting what they will actually do and how this will impact anywhere, everywhere else. Who knows? But what I do know is that this geopolitical fracturing of the global economy is unstoppable. And the main conclusion that I can draw from that is that uh, the world is going to need to rethink where it gets its raw materials from. And the main point I'm going to be making to the audience uh, in, in Vancouver is that the resource juniors are on the threshold of a monster boom like we have never seen before. And, you know, I'm going to use Lithium Mania 2.0 As an example, I mean, we have this situation here where if electric vehicles are supposed to replace uh, internal combustion engines by 235, 240, the world needs to increase its lithium supply almost tenfold. And that's without even considering the possibility that we get a really good lithium-ion battery that's safe because they managed to solve the electrolyte solid state problem and can use lithium metal for the uh, anode instead instead of graphite and you know there's lots of uh, uh, lithium being teed up through the uh, exploitation of brines in the uh, lithium triangle in South America Australia has done an absolute champion job mobilizing pegmatite deposits uh, it is now the biggest uh, source of lithium for the rest of the world but we still need a tenfold increase and these deposits are not giants. Uh, JADAR, which is regarded a giant uh, that Rio Tinto found, Rio Tinto says we need 60 of these. So you're not going to find 60 giant deposits. It's going to have to come from many, many different small to medium-sized deposits that get pushed through the development cycle and turned into lots and lots of mines. And the majors don't do that. The juniors are the ones that you know, you get a thousand juniors in us from Australia and Canada, all, you know, in the same uh, game of trying to find these deposits that are, are not world class, but are going to be good enough to feed this future lithium market. And this is going to be for all the various metals as we stop relying on places like Congo for, for world class deposits. Uh, you know, Siberia is a great source for world class deposits, uh, but that's not going to be happening anytime soon. And China itself, it's going to withdraw from the global stage and probably not end up uh, supplying raw materials to the rest of the world. It'll still try to supply 
uh, you know, finished goods and goods uh, uh, to the rest of the world, but it's going to end up using all its internal production for itself. So what I'm going to be focusing on in my presentation is to sort of educate the audience. How do you think about these resource juniors? What is their story path to success? And what are the strategies they are deploying? In the, in the old days, you would, uh, you know, just uh, go out there and explore in grassroots territory, do basic sampling, geochemical sampling, do some geophysical surveys, generate a target, drill it, make a discovery or not. But th this has been done many times over in the last 50 years with, uh, with, with modern technology in, in a lot of places. So finding low-hanging fruit through this old method just isn't going to work. So when a company comes up with a project, you're going to ask, okay, so what is the story? Why is this interesting? And what are you going to do to make this reality? And I've created a uh, kind of like a cheat sheet that uh, is a flow sheet of the different story paths that a project can go along with the strategies for success. Uh, it's a template uh, available on the on my website on the home page. You can click on it and it'll load a PDF. And I recommend to people to, to use this. And when you look, look call up a company or, or even research their website, try and trace the path of the project and where it is now, and then circle those strategies for success that it appears to be what it is that the company's doing that's different from what everybody else has done in the past with this particular project because we do not have too many areas of grassroots, pure grassroots exploration frontiers left to explore. Everything has been gone over before, so now you have to have a different way of looking at it, a way of rethinking old districts, uh, coming up with new methods to see deeper and farther, new geological models to think through what's going on. And of course, we have this context of rising metal prices. If the world fragments, into the Russia-China world, and then into the um, uh, sort of Europe-North uh, American world. And we have two different price sets for materials that are mined within these two jurisdictions. Forget about the cheaper price in China-Russia. That's a different world. There will be considerably less trade between these two. Look at the potential for higher real prices in the uh, sort of what's left of the world's democracy in these jurisdictions. And so to some degree, it also becomes an optionality play, the old feasibility demonstration play. So today, copper is $4 a pound. Well, maybe this works, maybe not so well, but does it work at $6 a pound? And what is the potential for $6 a pound if the world, at least the democracy world, uh, continues to push for goals like uh, switching from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. So I'm going to uh, introduce this concept and then the five companies in my session, I'm going to show them examples of these story paths and explain why I selected them to be part of my session at the Metals Investor Forum. What is the story path and success strategy for Adamira Minerals? Adamira Minerals is a company, it's got a couple hundred million shares fully diluted. It's trading around five, seven cents. So about a 12, 14 million dollar valuation. It's focused on northeastern Washington. Uh, it's had projects in the Republic Robin area for the past five, six years. It hasn't had any luck showing that the previous explorers and miners did not do a great job uh, in, in, in finding everything. They have not found really any deposits or zones overlooked by the others that are worth uh, taking, uh, you know, that are worth putting into production. But two years ago, Mark Kalibaba uh, noticed that the former Buckhorn mine, which Kin Ross uh, operated from 2008 until 2017, during which it produced uh, about 1.3 million ounces gold uh, at an average grade of roughly 13, 13 grams per ton, all the ground surrounding the or the mining lease had been dropped. And so he ended up on Adamera's behalf, staking all that ground, plus optioning the sort of smaller claims around it that the, the prospectors had picked up uh, as they as they came open. And the Buckhorn 1.0 deposit 
was discovered by Crown Resources, which was sort of a, a U.S. Uh, Canadian junior led by Mark Jones and, and Chris Harold. And it made this discovery in a district where there's hundreds of little small glory holes where, you know, around the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th, uh, prospectors and small-scale miners had poked around. There's gold smoke all over this area in, in the Toronto Garden which uh, had not had really had any significant mines the way the Republican Graben did to the east. And they managed to, uh, in following up one of these little glory holes and doing some geophysics and, and drilling beyond, basically discovering this blind scarn deposit that blossomed into three and a half million tons. And, and they wasted a decade trying to uh, uh, get it permitted as a 3,000 ton per day open pit mine. But open pit mining doesn't fly in Washington. Battle Mountain eventually gave up and, and went away. Though while it was there, they drilled a whole bunch of shallow holes, perversely looking for more open pitable, open pitable ground. And then in 2003, um, uh, the uh, uh, Crown switched to an underground mine scenario and uh, ended up being bought out in 2006 by Kinross, which had acquired Echo Bay, and the 2,000 ton per day Kettle River Mill uh, in, in, in the east, about 80 kilometers uh, by road from the, from the uh, Crown Jewel deposit. And, and they developed this as a 900 ton per day underground mine. Uh, they, that's only half the capacity of the mill. They trucked raw ore all the way to Kettle River, processed it there. They would have mined it at a higher rate, but based on the size of the deposit and the uh, the geometry of the system. This was really the optimal, optimal uh, uh, scenario that they that they could pursue, and they hoped to find more ore because clearly there's a lot of smoke in this area. Not a lot of drilling had been done by earlier explorers. Uh, Crown and its various partners had done a, a bunch of drilling, but it all tended to be kind of shallow. They put in a, a plan of operations. Uh, application for like 675 uh, drill pads and over 900 holes. They had assembled all this work from before and said, here's are all these targets that we need to hit to see if there is more of the original Buckhorn 1.0. And they hit the wall. At the time, it was in the Okanagan Wenatchee uh, Division of the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, that's really responsible for Western Washington, which is entirely focused on, on recreational activity, not commercial activity. They gave up. They shut down the mine, mothballed the mill, let all the claims drop. And so Adamera has picked up where they left. They call it Buckhorn 2.0. And they did a, scored a coup in September last year when they were able to do a deal with Kinross where they got all the historical data in Kinross's possession surrounding the original mining lease, and they have been digitizing it and relating it to the, the work that they had done. And they've come up with uh, three sets of eight targets, and they've divided it like that because they've managed to get three permitting jurisdiction. There's the state jurisdiction, there's the BLM jurisdiction, and there's the U.S. Forest Service. And they've been working on getting permits for these various target groups, uh, you know, for a year now. They think maybe by the early in the third quarter, they should have at least the BLM permits and they can go in there and start drilling these targets. So this company, it's taking an existing mine, wasn't quite world class, but it, but it sure uh, produced over a billion dollars worth of, worth of gold during its brief period. They're rethinking this district by going beyond the original mine site, which is still owned by Kinross, and looking at other models for, you know, is it just SCARN that we're looking for, or, or are there also epithermal-type systems in this vicinity? What explains all this gold smoke? And the, and the soil geochem shows gold anomalies in areas where there are no drill holes. So it's like taking this district that Crown got lucky in finding this uh, crown jewel deposit, went focused largely on developing it. It got mined out, and now it's a chance for this entire district to be revisited for the potential for multiple such deposits. And I was curious as to what would uh, 
um, Buckhorn 1.0 be worth today if you found it today and put it into production at 900 tons per day and were able to use the Kettle River Mill, which is still waiting there. It's a big reclamation liability for a, a, a Kinross if it ever wants to take it apart and clean out that place. So they're probably motivated to sell it, especially since they end up with a 1% NSR in the uh, Buckhorn 2.0 project for the for the data saw. Well, if they came up with a similar deposit, 3.5 million tons of 12.6 gram per ton gold uh, with a 1.3 million ounce recoverable at the 92% recovery that they had, that would be worth about $1 billion Canadian at an 8% uh, 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 discount rate. And for Adamera, if they were able to like make a discovery uh, with the money that they have now, and get their 27 million warrants between uh, 10 and 15 cents exercise that raised them 2.88 million dollars. That would take the stock up to four dollars plus as a as a prize. So we're talking from five cents to to four dollars. That's a, that's that's not a ten bagger. That's a potential hundred bagger. So this is a kind of a fantastic uh, bottom fish type story where you're rethinking this old district, applying new technology, compiling the old data, and taking a fresh look at something that never had a chance to be really pounded with modern exploration after the initial major discovery. What's the story path and success strategy for P2 Gold? Okay, Jim, P2 Gold is a KRO favorite. Unlike the other four companies, those are bottom fish spec value rated, so... Uh, the, the comments that I publish for Kaiser Research is for the subscribers only, except for what I might talk about in the, uh, in, in, in the Kaiser Watch form. But P2 Gold is a formal fair spec value rated favorite. Now it has two key stories. The more advanced stories is the GABS project. This is a copper gold porphyry system in Nevada that they acquired from Waterton, which, uh, during the bear market, uh, specialized in picking up all these distressed assets uh, all over the place and are now have now been busy uh, 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 optioning them out or selling them on you know terms for for royalty and uh, and, and and various cash payments and and p2 gold was able to acquire the rights to this project last year and there was an existing resource on this project uh, which they have now upgraded to about uh, Oh, it's uh, it's roughly about 113 million tons of 0.26 percent copper and 0.42 gram per ton gold. It consists of three separate deposits within this uh, land package, and it, the the work was done over like 30 years. Various groups looked at it um, because these deposits never hung together, uh, and 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 the grades were not super high. It never really advanced to, you know, becoming a mine. But what Ken McNaughton and Joe Osvenick have uh, done is said, okay, we have stronger gold and copper prices than prevailed during most of that past expiration period. Uh, we think that if we go in there and put the money in to stitch all these zones together and then develop a proper flow sheet, one that optimizes the processing of the the, the higher gold grade oxide zone first in the first five years and then proceeds to the deeper sulfide zone, we can demonstrate that this is worth putting into production. Now, um, the market has not been particularly um, generous in, in believing that uh, this thing is worth a lot more. So last year I put together an outcome visualization where I said, okay, let's take this resource Let's imagine that we're going to have a blended operation of doing heat leaching the oxide simultaneously while we're, we're milling, milling the sulfides. And let's do this at 20,000 tons, um, tons per, tons per day. And using the sort of recoveries that they've found in the, in their MET studies. And I was able to quantify that this project would be worth about 400 million Canadian, which is not huge. And CapEx would be about, uh, you know, 375 million U.S. So that's kind of really close in terms of uh, uh, the, the development hurdle. 
but the uh, for, for the stock, uh, what it has outstanding, fully diluted, about 97 million. Um, that would uh, result in a stock price of about four dollars a share down the road. Now the stock was recently up to 70, 75 cents. Uh, they were able to renegotiate the terms on the Waterton deal so that the big balloon payment uh, is deferred now until 20. 23. They expect to have the PEA done uh, by the end of this year, perhaps even uh, early, early in the fourth quarter. And that's what the market's waiting for. So we want you to, them to do the cost discovery. And they're focusing right now on um, infill drilling and expanding the uh, oxide zone because the first five years, that's where you uh, pay back your uh, capital cost. So they want to show that, okay, we understand the near surface portion and show that we can get payback and then get the market's respect for that. And they have an intriguing uh, blue sky potential because the geophysics show that there's a conductor at depth, uh, you know, well beneath the uh, sort of 300 meter limit uh, that has been uh, dr drilled about with these other three deposits in the past. And they suspect that at depth, the system, all these, these separate porphyry bodies coalesce into the original monzonite intrusion where the grade of copper and gold could be much better than the averages that they're dealing with these deposits near surface. And they believe there is room for that argument because if the host is the monzonite stock, where this shows up in the uh, near surface material that uh, has been explored in the past, it has a considerably better grade than the average. So the idea would be to demonstrate the block caving potential of a deeper, richer copper gold resource that might also be, uh, in tonnage terms, substantially bigger. And what's the sort of analogy for this sort of dream? Well, we can go back to 2000 when BHP sold the uh, Oyu Tolgoi deposits, the near surface zones, to Ivan, to Robert Friedland's Ivanhoe Mines. And at the time, this was marginal, yeah. Robert thought he could put it into production uh, uh, because he believed that copper prices were going to go go higher, and eventually they did. And those zones are now being, you know, going to be put are in production. But the big story was that he did. Friedland brought the geophysicists in there and said, "Let's look around and see what's all going on at depth." And that resulted in the discovery of the deeper uh, Hugo Dummett zone. Which had a two, two times, two to three times the gold and copper grade. Well, considerably more than what's needed to do an underground mine. And this is now a world class asset which Rio Tinto controls and is now the, the Torquoise Hill resources. It's now got a bid out to uh, acquire the rest of uh, uh, what it doesn't already own. But that's the sort of example where you look at this existing system, you go in to demonstrate that, yeah, at the higher metal prices, it's going to work. Um, but we're also going to look deeper and farther to see if there's a lot more to this system than, 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 than was previously uh, 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 assumed. The other project that P2 Gold has got going is the BABS, the BAM project, which is in the Golden Triangle. And this is sort of a, between Galore Creek to the west, which is in a horribly remote area, and, and the sort of the road that's to the east, and it's close to a road, so it's not as infrastructurally challenged as Galore Creek itself, which is a, which is a world-class deposit, but it's in a location that's absolutely terrible. And this project had seen some work in the uh, 60s and 70s. There's some high-grade copper showing, some high-grade gold showings that various groups had poked at, but most of that property has a 10 million uh, year old layer of the Mount Eziza, uh a basalt flow that sort of paved over that whole area. In fact, the northern area is, is a park uh, because uh, uh, the, these, these volcanic uh, uh, lava flows are, are, are visually quite, quite, quite stunning. But uh, Charlie Gregg was in that area, noticed it, uh, put together the geological context and and uh, Ken McNaughton and Joe Austin decided, well, we, we're going to option this. And they discovered the Monarch Gold Zone last year, which is uh, the silt, a layer of cake of siltstone and, and dollow stones. The dollow stones are, are more tough, massive, 
whereas the siltstones are more brittle, and they found gold in this system. And they are, this is where the, the blue sky resides. So they'll be drilling an 8,000-meter-plus program in, 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 in July. They're doing a geophysical survey because they have this theory that the contact between a very old granitic intrusion to the east and the sedimentary package to the west is also a primary gateway for a, a, a younger porphyry intrusion similar to Galore Creek in style, and that the gold they're seeing in the monarch zone and also in the copper zone to the south, all this is very peripheral to this porphyry system. And the porphyry system, well, if it's there, it's going to be, be very, very deep, sort of an Oyutolgoi type, Hugo Dummett type system, and, and they're not too interested in that right now. What they're interested in is where the fluids came up in this structure, found the sedimentary layer of beds with the siltstones in it where they already can see at the surface where they've drilled that decent wide intersection. They're going to chase this down the bedding into this uh, structural zone, what they believe to be a feeder, and see if that's where the gold grade blossoms and that they have a major underground mine. So so this this play, it's it's not an old mining district. It's it's in a general area which has seen a lot of exploration, but in this particular location, there was never anything there that uh, encouraged previous explorers to throw more, more dollars at it because what they could see was sporadic and small, didn't seem to lead anything. And the, uh, the cover rocks, the younger cover rocks, obscured everything to the east. So you had to actually bring geological big picture thinking to play and say, ah, what's on the surface is boring, but what's going on at depth is very interesting. What is the story path and success strategy for Searchlight Resources? Searchlight Resources is the brainchild of Stephen Wallace, who's one of these geologists uh, who spends his spare time going through archives, looking at historical work, who did what, where, and he's also watches the land position. He's decided to focus on Saskatchewan because Saskatchewan, uh, uh, it, it has these major mining districts like the western half of the Flin Flon system. It's got the Athabasca Basin where the world's richest uranium mines exist. They, of course, have the potash deposits in the south, but that's not really available for a junior. And it has all this uh, teaser stuff in the north, a potential copper red bed system such as Janus Lake of Forum Energy, where where Rio Tinto has a, has spent over fourteen million dollars as part of a deal to earn eighty percent, but seems to be stalled right now in moving this this forward. And what Stephen has done is assembled a portfolio of projects in 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 Saskatchewan, and one that caught his attention was Kulik Lake, and this had some very high grade rare earth. Uh, Values and this is a light rare earth system, a, a monazite system. And it was found in the 60s, 70s, and academics have written stuff about it. Uh, and nobody ever paid it much attention. Saskatchewan has the Hoytus Lake Dyke system. Uh, there's some other rare earth showings in that area that another junior is exploring. But Saskatchewan has never really yielded any any rare earth. Uh, um, type of, you know, world-class mines. But the potential seems to be there. So so Searchlight had staked Kulik Lake, and this year, or last year, what they did is there's a new type of a, a radiometric survey that has been successfully used in the southwestern part of the basin to help find uh, uh, the triple R deposit and the aero deposit, uh, the boulder trains, uh, uh, which have made next-gen and, and, and fission uh, Owners of uh, you know significant new basement hosted high grade uh, uranium deposits, and Searchlight applied it to the Kulik Lake trend, where there was about a one kilometer of showings for rare earths that didn't really hang together, which is why nobody ever did anything with it. And they flew this survey along this trend, and because they wanted to see what the thorium signature is, and this type of uh, survey it detects radiation, and lo and behold. The Kulik Lake Zone has a, a thorium anomaly that covers three kilometers, well beyond the one kilometers where mm. some sampling has been done. So clearly they have 
a rarer prospect here with much bigger scale than previously assumed. But the big surprise that came out was that just to the south, there was a 500 meter wide, two kilometer long uranium anomaly that nobody had any idea was there. There was like nobody had tripped over any uranium and had used their scintillometer to say, oh, there's some uranium outcrop. So this was a huge surprise. And because of the nature of the anomaly, this will be a near surface system. Now, the problem is it's about uh, 100 kilometers south of the Athabasca Basin. And around the 60s, 70s, uh, the Athabasca Basin unconformity style deposits, the very high grade, you know, you know Key Lake, Rabbit Lake, and then later MacArthur and, and Cigar Lake. These were discovered. These are deposits that run 10% plus uranium, uh, uh, and, and they're, they're deeper. You have to, you know, mine them at the interface between the sandstone that sits in the basin on top of the basement uh, unconformity. And everybody went to the Athabasca Basin and forgot about everything else around it, including the Wollaston Domain, which is this 400-kilometer-plus uh, long, 100-kilometer-wide set of rocks that underlies the eastern flank of the Athabasca Basin. And in that area, the, there are uranium deposits that the underlying basement is the Wollaston Domain. But the prejudice has been that well, the, the uranium deposits are there because of the basin, that the weird uh, 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 fact that there's this cavity, this hole, not caused by a, a crater, uh, by, by a meteor or anything like that, but simply a sort of a regional tectonic thing that resulted in this hole in the earth that gradually filled with basins that structures uh, passed through and pumped the fluids through that harvested the uranium from all this uh, uh, former granitic rocks, which are just, which are naturally radioactive to a low degree, and created the kitchen that fed all these deposits. So the bias has been there's really nothing of consequence outside of the uh, Athabasca Basin. So this interesting thing, uh, 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 anomaly here, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, 3-4% uranium because it's at surface, uh, so it could be open pit mine. So this will be a project that the company goes into this summer with a dual program of, you know, detailed surface mapping, sampling to see what this uh, rare earth target, three kilometer rare earth target is really all about. And also what is this uranium target all about? If they're lucky they might be able to get to drill it in the in the fourth quarter before before winter makes things miserable there. Uh, but more likely they would drill it early in uh, in twenty twenty three when everything is frozen and easy and easy to drill. And the other project that they have which uh is is not like this, which is really an old mineralized showing that you know never really amounted to anything. It's in the middle of nowhere, and we have an entirely new target there at Kulik Lake. The other one is a, what you call a district rethink. So, Flint Flon's known for its uh, massive sulfide copper deposits, uh, and that overwhelmed everything else. But to the west, on the Manitoba side, there were a whole bunch of these orogenic. Uh, gold vein systems that uh, various groups poked away at it was small scale mining they would chase these veins down you know 100 150 feet uh, until they couldn't find them anymore and it all sort of just sat in the shadow of the Flint Flon VMS copper mining district and it was fragmented ownership held by various groups and what Stephen did is he started uh, consolidating this district, district, acquiring these various little claim packages and putting them together. They've done minor drilling, but they have not really yet tackled the rethink of this district, which is the first goal is to assemble it all under one ownership. And then you start looking at the potential. Well, what happens at depth? What if we get enough capital together to chase these, these gold zones down plunge? Do they get bigger and better at depth? Is it just a coincidence that everything at surface uh, is, is small scale and not very interesting? Um, if it is a coincidence, well, maybe uh, the better stuff is at depth. So that's sort of the plan B project that they have in addition to all these other projects that they have going on. The focus right now is rethinking Kulik Lake's rare earth potential and following up on this brand new 
serendipity-style discovery that there's a significant near-surface uranium system present, who's great, of course, they do not know because they have not even had a chance to put boots on the ground and, and scrape away the moss and sample to see what this material uh, grades that surface. But the nature of the radiometric anomaly is such that there will be a uranium mineralized system presence. The question is, what does the grade average in this? Is it high enough for this to be an open pitable uranium deposit? And if it is, this will open up a much broader region of Saskatchewan for uranium exploration beyond the uh, Athabasca Basin itself. And of course, for the rare earth potential, uh, if this is something significant, sure, it's light rare earths, but the, the electric vehicle future needs the magnets that the neodymium and praseodymium uh, make possible. So Saskatchewan itself could undergo uh, a rare earth exploration boom if somebody can show that there are serious deposits present in this province where in the past it was assumed it was all just little vein or dike-like material that was never worth developing uh, as long as big deposits like Mountain Pass and Bayon Oval ruled the roost in terms of rare earth supply and well before the new uses with the uh, electric vehicles and their magnet requirements became a, a growing reality. What is the story path and success strategy for Van Star Mining? Van Star Mining has a 20% carried interest in the Nelligan deposit. And this Van Star itself uh, discovered this uh, deposit uh, around 2012. It's in the Shibugamu area. Uh, there's been lots of sort of smallish mines. Shibugamu itself is more known for the uh, for, for for its copper mines, uh, its copper district. Uh, but this attracted the attention of I am Gold. I am Gold ended up farming into it and has a deal where it uh, will earn 80 percent uh, by basically uh, delivering feasibility study and making a decision to take this into production. Now. So this was a grassroots discovery, and it's not a district rethink or anything. In fact, it's a new style of deposit that it turns out to be uh, open pitable. Um, they, uh, it's, it's about uh, 97 million, uh, 97 million tons of one gram per ton gold. I've done an outcome visualization because what the, the company really needs to know, at least the junior Vanstar is, you know, what is this thing worth if you wanted to do an open pit mine for it? And this has been the problem. This is why the stock's cheap, down in the 35 cent range. I am Gold's priority has been Cote project in Ontario. Uh, it acquired this through its buyout of Trelawney. It's, it's a sort of a large bulk tonnage open pit situation. They've been working on it for a number of years. This has been its priority. Uh, shareholders are unhappy with the company. They just announced a major uh, cost overrun in the construction of this project, which is what helped the Vanstar a little, little bit lower. And, uh, because, okay, uh, this, this, the Nelligan project should be now in the midst of a PEA stage. They should have finished the expansion drilling some time ago. They did do drilling last year. They got results that show that the Renard zone extends to the west, will add tonnage, got reasonable grade. Uh, they've got holes pending, uh, chasing this deeper because in the past they limited to the uh, sort of open pit drill drill limit because they weren't thinking about what might be happening at a deeper level. So we're waiting to see those final results. What happens at depth with the Renard zone? Does it get richer and better, skinnier and richer, or, or, or more of the same? Can you extend the, uh, the pit? And the hope is that by the sometime by the end of this year, there is an updated resource that boosts the 3.2 million ounces to towards the 5 million ounce range. But what is this, what they do have right now potentially worth? Well, I borrowed uh, from First Mining um, uh, its, its project. Uh, uh, as an example, I used its uh, feasibility study numbers and imagined a uh, 30,000 ton per day mine similar cost scenario, and it would be worth about 1.2 billion Canadian. So for that 20% interest, 
and the number of shares Vanstar has out was about 65 million fully diluted. That would translate into a future stock price in the, in the three to four dollar a share range. So this is a classic bottom fish. We don't know when they can monetize that. I am gold controls all aspects of it. So it's in no hurry to do anything, uh, uh, to, 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 to help out the Vanstar. So, so it's a bit of a waiting game. Now, ironically, the Cote troubles, uh, may end up speeding things up because it's possible that uh, a, a, a mid-tier producer like I am Cold ends up being punished in the market so badly that a bigger company acquires it, takes over completing the Cote development, and then, of course, Nelligan's sitting there, and they have all the cash in the world, so all of a sudden, this thing could go on a fast track, and it might be possible to monetize this project uh, a lot uh, a lot sooner than the market thinks. So that's sort of the bottom fish bet, that there's going to be a change in the perceived timeline for when Nelligan will go into the development pipeline of feasibility demonstration. But the company is in my show again after being in it uh, last September um, because they managed to get a deal from I am Gold on the Bosquet Onido project, which is near the Westwood Doyon mill complex that I am Gold operates uh, uh, on on the Cadillac uh, Cadillac break in, in Quebec, and that mine is underutilized. Uh, the they cannot feed it enough enough ore to have it going at full capacity, so it's a bit of a problem for I am Gold. They had explored this Bosquet project with the idea of. Uh, let's let's find some open pitable resources and feed it to this to our Westwood Doyon mill complex. And they only scraped together a couple hundred thousand ounces and lost interest. And the, the J C Sam Moore was able to persuade I am go well give us a shot on this. Let us option seventy five percent for four million expiration. We can keep spending. Uh, and I am go said okay, but we get the back in for you know a net fifty percent any time by spending four times what you did. And so the company has now started a 4,000 meter drill program to chase the Bosquet system deeper because all the drilling in the past has been shallow focused. They expect this 4,000 meter program of about a dozen holes to be done by, by mid-June or possibly assays by, by July. And what they're hoping to repeat is the success that Amex exploration had with the Peron project where, you know, for decades it was this system that just never hit the threshold to be worth developing until several years ago they hit a high grade zone where the grade and, and width blossomed and that's now, uh, you know, they've, they've raised over 50, somewhere between 50 and 100 million dollars to demonstrate that this thing needs to be a standalone mine. In the exploration VP, Kelly Malcolm, uh, that there's overlap between management of Vanstar and Amex. He's also looked at this Bosquet potential. He says, you know, this orogenic system, uh, its potential to blossom at depth, it's real. Go in there. You won't be able to get any uh, cheating from uh, visible gold because this system, the gold is associated with the sulfide. So, so they'll get excited if they start seeing, uh, you know, thick intervals of sulfides at depth, but they really won't know what the gold grade is until the assays come in. So this is a rethinking of a sort of marginal gold system within a general uh, mining camp region uh, where they are saying, let's go deeper, let's chase this deeper, see what happens at depth, let's see if it gets bigger and better. What's the story path and success strategy for Zephyr Minerals? You know, Zephyr Minerals, um, I had them at the Metals Investor Forum in, in, in January 2020 based on its uh, Colorado project, the Dawson Green Mountain uh, Gold System, where they had come up with this idea that the El Plomo portion, which was a downdrop uh, segment with the, of this land package, had potential for a Broken Hill style system based on the geochemistry of the area, the geological context, the existence of a decent grade but skinny uh, 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 zinc lead silver silver zone and they did a drill program in in 2020 during the whole covid period and it turned out that the uh, magnetic anomaly which they had hoped would be 
the sort of the, the bulging that comes when the pyrotite gets all squeezed from a you know, traditional uh, SEDEX system into a broken hill type system and, and it all gets bunched up in the ball. Well, when they drilled it, the, well, the, the zone was even skinnier than it was at surface. And it turned out that the magnetic anomaly was an illusion created by, you know, magnetic minerals in the rock itself. So they've pretty much given up on that. Uh, they are trying to get a permit to go underground and chase the uh, gold zone, which is a, is, a, is a mesothermal orogenic type system, which could go forever at depth, but its orientation is bad. It pokes into the mountain, so you can't really chase it down, down plunge uh, without drilling extremely long holes. And that permitting cycle is, is stalled because they need to go in there and do more well watering, well monitoring studies, and so that's going to take at least another year. But early last year, Lauren Comperto, who has experience working in third world frontiers, noticed that Zimbabwe had undergone a significant change. Now Zimbabwe, that, that's in the sort of southern part of, of Africa, north of, uh, uh, you know, South Africa and, and Botswana. It's, uh, used to be called Rhodesia. It was after, after Cecil Rhodes. It was one of those, uh, British imperial outposts forever. The, the language they speak there is English. But in the, after the 60s, uh, Robert Mugabe, who was part of the uh, guerrilla movement, uh, fighting the, uh, the British, uh, 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 imperialists that ran the place, he ended up in charge and the company, country became a, dysfunctional dictatorship so that in the 90s, even though all these other third world frontiers opened up in the rest of the world and in Latin America, other parts of Africa and the Australian and Canadian Junior swarmed into these regions and found all kinds of wonderful deposits where, you know, only snippets had been found in the past. They followed up, pursued it further, applied modern mining and, and exploration methods. Zimbabwe had to sit this all out because they they uh, insisted that foreign com countries could not have a majority interest. And, of course, that meant nobody could go in there and really control anything. So it was a an exploration pariah for the last uh, 20, 25 years. And it's an interesting country which is resource-rich. There's the Great Dyke, which has extraordinary platinum group and chromium potential. That's all still part of the government reserve and and doled out to, to various groups on a, you in, know, in, in individual basis. But the rest of the country has all these greenstone belts, and these have been operated on a small scale by artisanal workers for over a hundred years. In fact, since, uh, 1930, uh, they've, uh, uh all averaged almost 400,000 ounces from these, uh, shear zones and greenstone belts, uh, per year, uh, consistently, except for a brief period about 10 years ago when, when things got a little hairy politically. And a couple of years ago, in 2017, Robert Mugabe got kicked out. They finally got fed up. He kicked him out. He died of cancer in 2019. And the country is now on the path back to restoring itself as a functional country. And they changed in, in 2020, they changed the mining law so that foreign companies can once again own 100% subject to that 10% or so stake uh, carried interest that the, that the government takes. And so there's been a push, a rush of companies, mainly more senior companies like B2 Gold, into the country to try and assemble these land packages where these artisanal workers get these very small claims and, um, you know, work them with, with small, you know, four ton per day type operations, very, very small scale. And, and they still churn out these 400,000 ounces a year from hundreds of these little, 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 uh, mining operations chasing the higher grade portion. So the, the story here is what if you go in there and look at these systems from a bulk tonnage point of view? Uh, and instead of like looking at a two, three meter wide, uh, you know, half ounce to three quarter ounce system, Let's look at it in terms of a hundred meter wide system with, you know, where we include the, the lower grade envelope and mine it at say one, one and a half grams per ton, such as been, has been done in Western Africa and in places like Burkina Faso. And that's the big 
land rush 30 years after it began for everybody else in the rest of the world. It is now beginning in Zimbabwe. And so the idea is Zephyr's gone in there, made applications for large uh, uh, licenses covering areas of greenstone belts. Uh, the underlying small claim owners, well, they get to continue to have that. But if they get these uh, EPOs granted, well, then they can go in there and start looking at the bigger picture, start applying modern exploration, and try to demonstrate that, oh, here's a million, two million ounce system. Oh, here's a million and a half ounce system that can be open, fit, mine, developed. So that's the story for Zephyr Minerals going into this country. And this country has a legacy. It has had a proper geological survey over all these decades. So again, there's a lot of information in the archives available uh, for groups like Zephyr Minerals to go in there to check out and, uh, and, 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 and then go home in on these areas, figure out who's there, who isn't. And then it's a bit of a roulette thing. You put in your application and you have to wait up to a year. They, they put in applications last year. They think that sometime in the, in the, in the final quarter of this year, they will be in the running to have the Mount Darwin EPO application, uh, granted. Meanwhile, they're doing what everybody else is allowed to do, uh, staking small claim blocks in areas where there are artisanal workings or just as they did the other day, uh, with, with the Chikonga, uh, acquisition, small 40 hectare land position. They optioned it on easy terms, 75%. So here's a shear zone where the, the miner was operating at four tons per day. They're going to go in there and start to, uh, look at it from a bigger picture point of view. And Zimbabwe, with its abundance of greenstone belt, with hundreds and hundreds of small operations like that for the past hundred years, never really going very deep, uh, to, you know, to open pit limits even. This is a potential, this is a new frontier for bulk tonnage gold exploration that has opened up for Western mining companies. And Zephyr Minerals is one of the few juniors that has ventured into this area. John, looking forward to seeing you at the Metals Investor Forum in Vancouver and the Resource Investment Conference in Vancouver, May 15th through to the 18th. Uh, Jim, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to being out there and uh, not exactly going to be uh, shaking hands, but I'm going to be really looking forward to looking people in the eye and, uh, and interact with them like one used to be able to do before this COVID pandemic uh, locked everything down. I've been speaking with John Kaiser. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Kaiser Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at kaiserresearch.com.